Coming to you live from Radio Canaan Studio. For the record. For the record. For the record. Here, Here from, from your, your government, government officials, officials, independents, and the opposition on issues that matter to you. For the record. Engage in an open dialogue between residents and lawmakers. For the record. For the record. For the record. Informative, impartial, insightful. This is your talk show. 1 800 534 8255. Your calls, your input. This is For the Record. And now, your host, Arit Connor. Good morning and welcome to For the Record. Today is Friday, the third day of November 2017. I trust that everyone had a wonderful evening, restful one, those who were at home and those who uh, were working the midnight shift, uh, you got your rest this morning uh, as well. I was listening to the proceedings in our legislative assembly uh, last night as well. Actually, I was listening to um, switching from one, well, I had radio on on one station, 89.9, .9, and then I had my phone, and, and the uh, uh, radio came on up, up on 105.3, so I'm listening to, to both at the same time, the previous day's proceedings as well as listening to it live. But we'll have a lot to talk about in terms of the Legislative Assembly as well, and I have a little criticism for Radio Cayman as well. I'm going to get on their back also. Uh, you know, I might not uh, be on the show after today because they're my boss, but I, you know, I, I have to tell it like it is and give criticism where it uh, needs to be... Uh, uh, or make criticism where it needs to be made and give plaudits where, when plaudits are um, deserved as well. So lots to talk about today. Uh, I want to thank you, our listening and viewing audience, for allowing Radio Cayman and by extension for the record into your homes, into your vehicles as you traverse the busy roads of the Cayman Islands, into your places of work, whether it be an office cubicle or if you're working in the outdoors. I need not tell you that Radio uh, that for the record is a show produced by the staff and the management of Radio Cayman, and it is geared towards keeping you abreast of issues as they arise and play out on the local, regional, and international scene. I am your host, Orrit Connor. My two co-hosts with me, Ms. Theresa Pitcairn, and Dr. Steve McFeel, and you're welcome to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 7.30 a.m. until 9.30 a.m. During that period, our phone lines are always open, and there is always someone there waiting to take your calls. It is normally that beautiful radio voice of Ms. Susan Watson. You can call us on our toll-free number provided courtesy of Flow. That toll-free number is 1-800-534-8255. You can also call us on 949-8037 and 949-6990. You can email us if you don't want to talk on the telephone. Email us at for the record. That is one word, for the record at C A N D W dot K Y. And when you do email us, we will check our emails uh, consistently to determine if there are any emails are there, and we will do our endeavor best, our endeavor, to ensure that we give it the attention that it warrants during the course of our show as well. It is my pleasure to have in the studio with me this morning Mr. Theresa Pitcairn, one of my co-hosts, Dr. Steve McFeel, uh, as well. And with it being Friday, it is the day that is reserved for the official Opposition, and it is our pleasure to have in the studio with us this morning again, Emily and leader of the opposition, Mr. D. Ezard Miller, with us. So we're going to go around the table and say our good mornings, and then we're going to get into the meat of the program this morning. Ms. D., good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Hi, good morning. Thanks so very much for having me. And I'm going to be pretty brief because I know Mr. Uh, Miller's time. See, I didn't call you um, McLean this morning. <laughs> I know that Mr. Miller's time is quite limited, and uh, thanks very much for having us. Welcome uh, to For the Record. A point, I think that... Um, in asking the tough questions on this show, we are actually assisting our community in getting accustomed to constructive criticism. And I think people are more engaging and more embracing uh, that you know you can have a different point of view and still get along and still be friends. 
although I'm now seeing a lot of disruption in the house <laughs> and they, 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 barely, they barely started. Yes. So with that, I'll just leave it to the other three gentlemen that's on the show this morning. Okay, mm-hmm. I'll go to my other co-host first, Dr. Steve McField. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mr. For the Record. And good morning to our new co-host, Mr. Risa Pitcairn. And good morning to the Honorable as a Miller leader of, of the opposition. And good morning to all your listeners in For the Record land locally and those that are listening abroad. This week has been um, an eye-opener for me. Um, I remember the days when you had Ezard when he was there, Mr. Miller, and Benson, and, um, and Mr. Warren Connolly, and Norman Borden, and Truman Borden, and all of those people. And it was a pleasure to go down to the House to hear debates. Debates were sometimes fiery and stuff, but they were debates, and you, there was no personality, no name-calling. And I saw them... Um, interacting in the common room afterwards, eating their uh, eating their meals and and and, and ribbing one another, and um, it was a a glorious time uh, in the development of the parliamentary system in Cayman Islands. But today, it seems to me that everything's become very personal, and I was very shocked to see the, um, to hear what's happening, especially um, reading um, the 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 bulletin with with, with where the where the where the um, the speaker in, is now saying that the, the the court has no right to the answers to the answers of the house, and I mean, I and 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 um, and, and and interpretation of of statutes and, and laws one hundred one, it says that one of the means in which you identify what the meaning of a law or a statute is that you go to the answers of the house to see what the debate was and how and 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 and, and what the reason for bringing the law and what the mischief that it was supposed to, to have covered. I just don't understand where we are going with, with, with this with this thing. It seems to me that that and then and then and then the, the speaker the speakers um I was surprised that the speaker um it says here speaker questions PAC role. Well the PAC the the PAC could be the public account committee is a standing committee of the whole house and I wonder how the speaker can interfere and what does and the and and the park commission's role in questioning the government on the on on the on the, on the finances because that is what it's for. It is the it is the it is the primary committee in the in the in the whole in the whole parliamentary system because it questions the government on everything that it expands and everything that it that that that, it, that it's supposed to bring in and go out is what Captain um is what Captain Captain one one Captain told told his 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 ranger when he went to set lap. He says to him, Sonny, let me tell you one thing. The guy say, well, it's a coincidence. And he say, I wonder if Duke and Mary had the same coincidence. And he say, what do you mean, sir? He say, listen, son, listen here. He says, come in here, son. Let me show you my distant ledger. You see, on my left hand, it's what I put out. And my right hand is what I took in. You see, I put out on 172 pounds 10 on this on this trip to Mesquita Key, and I took in 172 pounds 10. He <laughs> said, that's what I mean, sir. That's a coincidence. That's the first time that happened. So... The park committee has the right to see whether there's a coincidence or not. <laughs> Mr. Miller, good morning, sir. Welcome morning. to For the Record. Good morning. to have you again. Morning, Mr. Connor, and morning to Teresa, and morning, Dr. McField, and morning to the listening public. Yeah, to say that this um, meeting of the assembly has been eventful is probably the understatement of the of the year. Uh, most of us uh, senior members of the legislative assembly were taken aback and, and, and aghast at the speaker's um, new rules and his interpretation of the rules. Um, let me deal with the, with the PAC committee first, is that the problem is that the PAC committee is doing now what the PAC committee is supposed to do, just scrutinizing and getting to the bottom and the issues of what goes on in government that needs to be corrected. And for some reason, they seem to be be wondering, be concerned about what's going on. Um, but it is rather disingenuous and rather forgetful for the speaker to accuse me of operating the Public Accounts Committee outside of my remit. I just want to record a little bit of history for the country and you and for the record here. This is the same member of parliament who bullied himself into getting elected to the Public Accounts Committee 
in May 2013. The Parliament put him on the Public Accounts Committee over people like myself and Mr. Art McLean, who were all nominated. He went on the Park Committee. He bullied his way into becoming Deputy Chairman, which does not exist in the committee. In fact, the standing orders specifically prohibit the appointing of a Deputy Chairman in that it clearly states that in the absence of the Chairman, the committee has to elect a Chairman for that meeting. He then bullied himself into becoming a witness before the committee of which he is illegally the Deputy Chairman. Right? He then proceeded as a witness to completely and personally attack and try to destroy the reputation of the Auditor General, Mr. Starbuck, who is a sitting member of the committee of which is a Deputy Chairman. His performance on that committee was so bad that the Premier, at the time, had to come to his two political arch enemies, the member for Northside, Ezra Miller, and the member for Eastern, Arden McLean, and beg us to support him removing Mr. Bush from the Public Accounts Committee because of his behavior was unacceptable. We agreed with him. He then asked me to be the chairman of the committee, right? That's how I became chairman of the committee. Because Mr. Bush, who is now saying that for some reason I am misbehaving on the Public Accounts Committee and he needs to rein us in, right? And claiming that he is the, I'm not sure what our biter is, or, you know, but that he's the claim that he, he maintains that he's the final authority. That's not so. The final authority in the Legislative Assembly is the body of the Legislative Assembly. That be, the body of the Legislative Assembly can override anything that the Speaker does. But everybody, you know, he has the Premier and his government, by what my grandfather would talk, the cojones, and his throat all too. So they're allowing him to get away with all of this, right? And nobody's challenging him. But I can promise you, this challenge is coming. Folks, I want to remind you that you're listening to For the Record. I'm your host, Dorit Conn, in the studio with me this morning, my two co-hosts, Dr. Steve McField, Mr. Risa Pitcairn, and of course we have with us the Honorable D. Ezard Miller, Leader of the Opposition. Please stay tuned. For the Record will be back shortly. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record in the studio with me this morning, Mr. Risa Pitcairn, Dr. Steve McField, and the Leader of the Opposition, Honorable D. Ezard Miller. I'm going to shift gears for a minute. Um, we saw... Some news releases in relation to the joint pre-joint ministerial council meeting that was held in Miami last week with the British overseas territories and talking about development aid, of talking about aid for the jurisdictions, the countries, the islands that were hit by the recent hurricanes. And there is some good news for the overseas territory, the territories, the British overseas territories. They were basically prevented from accessing the 19 point something billion, I think it is, overseas international development aid that the UK has because of the high GDP. And a request was made to the OECD and all 30 uh, member states had to basically uh, approve it. But uh, the BBC has now reported that Britain will now be able to spend official development aid on hurricane hit islands after changes to international rules agreed in Paris. During this year, hurricane season, the UK government was not able to release funds to its Caribbean territories as they were deemed too rich. But the body that seat sets rules on aid said money could be spent when catastrophic humanitarian crisis hit. The International Development Secretary described this as a real step forward. So the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, OECD, ruled on Tuesday that aid could be used for short-term help in middle-income countries. 
Under current OECD rules, some of the small island nations in the Caribbean that were hit by Hurricane Irma last month were unable to receive official development assistance, known as ODA, because their national incomes are, are too high. The OECD's Development Assess Assistance Committee rejected the UK plan for small island states to be allowed to waive the emergency rules. So they didn't allow the uh, uh, waiver of emergency rules, but instead the 30 member countries backed a different plan to use official aid in temporary emergencies, but under crucial condition that no OAD, that's um, no um, overseas development assistance is diverted from existing recipients in the process. Uh, the, uh, they also agreed to establish a new mechanism for middle-income countries to be in re reinstated on the list of OED eligible recipients if they suffer a long-term economic decline. So they are trying to modernize the rules of the OECD now, and it looks like the cries of a lot of countries uh, and leaders in the Caribbean that this whole issue of using uh, per capita income to determine whether or not you qualify for aid needs to be abandoned because there are times when you may be sitting quite good and then uh, 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 there's a, a major catastrophe that would impact you where you actually need to access those funds. So as long as it doesn't affect what the other countries that need aid are getting, then they're allowed to access it now. So that is good news. That is good news in particular for the BVI. And we know that the Premier of the British Virgin Islands and the Governor of the British Virgin Islands are both in London at this point in time lobbying the UK authorities for this. So this will ease the, you know, some of the pressures on them and may, may, will make their trip and their negotiations certainly much easier as well. We have been critical of the UK in terms of the aid that they provide, but we know also that they have been hamstrung by these OECD rules as well. So I just want to uh, to, to bring that to the but, table. But, Back but to you, Mr. Not hamstrung by OECD rules. They're hamstrung by the OECD rules on that particular fund. But they have other funds that they could Yes, yes, they would have to access. But, but, but uh, see, let, 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 let's, I'm mm -hmm. glad to hear that they're getting help, but I want us to talk about our concerns here mm -hmm. about Parliament being destroyed in Cayman mm -hmm. by the Speaker. No, That's we're what we talk, need to talk about. That we're, going, we're, going, we're going to talk about that as well, but, uh, you know, I just wanted to shift gears because I, I have my audience out there that no, need no, to hear no, about no, that no, too. No, no, yeah. that. And I agree that's a good thing. But okay. And mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll transition over now to the LA. And what I want to say to my listening audience, I have encouraged them to listen to live broadcastings when they can. Not everyone has the ability to listen to them live during the course of the day. Some people who are unemployed, like myself, can do so. <laughs> but I, I have that luxury, and believe you me, I welcome that luxury as well to be able to do that. But if I'm going to encourage listeners, people, the Cayman Islands, to get involved and to listen, whether it be live or if it be a rebroadcast of it, then we have to first, number one, get quality. And I say quality, and I put an emphasis on that quality debate and presentations in our legislative assembly. Number two, it has to be timely. Do the, 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 the stations that are broadcasting it, that are carrying it live, I don't need to hear music playing for 45 minutes and I have missed 45 minutes of the proceedings because for some reason there was a glitch between the LA and the radio station that uh, you know you couldn't pick it up. So we have to ensure that the quality of the service that we're providing and that the quality of the debate that is coming out of the legislative assembly. Now a friend asked me last night, how did a particular candidate do? And I said, not well. He was sketchy. He was all over the place. Only this morning I was able to determine why that sketchiness and why the person was all over the place in terms of their debate was because, and I'll let Mr. Miller explain that to us as well. But I, I think that, that um, the member was not fully ready, right? 
but the speaker was closing the debate mm -hmm. because he said, you know, normally the speaker asks if any other member wishes to speak for three times. Then nobody gets up. Then he calls on the thing. But this thing was done very rapidly, <laughs> right? And two members rose at, um, at the time. The um, member for Georgetown South and the member for um, Georgetown Central. And the speaker already called for the for the winding up of the debate, mm -hmm. right? And then he decided to to be because the the premier who's going to wind up the debate wasn't even in the in the in the chambers uh, to allow the the debate to continue. Mm -hmm. And the member for um, Georgetown Central did the gentleman thing. He was giving way to the later representative from. Uh, George down south to speak, but the speaker insisted that it was his eye. He caught the member for Central. His eye had caught in the member for Central, and the member for Central had to speak. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a certain amount of, of, of empathy for him because he was caught a bit off guard. Um, and then the other thing with all these new rules that are now imposed on you, I mean, we can't even use the word coward. Is certain coward is certainly an unparliamentary word, right? Um, and the constant interruption and in, 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 in interfering in the debate by the speaker, right? That the, he was he was often when he got on a flow about something, he was stopped by the speaker. He was disrupted by the speaker because that wasn't in the budget, you know. And and for a for a first time, this is this this is the first budget address for this member. Mm -hmm. You know, we always one of the one of the rules of parliament you can't read your speech. Right? <laughs> but I heard a lot of that. No, I heard but, a lot but, of that but, go, but, going but again, on there. But again, we have always been respectful to new members coming in. Okay, okay. And we have always given them a year or, 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 or at least a couple of meetings, you know, to, to, to read your speech and, and get familiar because it is not, it's a very intimidating thing, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Un unless you've been there. But, but Mr. <coughs> Dr. Mike Field and, 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 and Teresa would, would have the appreciation of, of appearing the first time before a judge. You know, you're, you're very careful, and you like to know you got your stuff organized, and you wonder. And, and, and it was it was so unfortunate that that the member for Central was was, was treated so badly by, by by the speaker, you know. And it is it. But I thought he I, I thought he did well. I, I I thought he was very but, passionate but, 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 about, on, about what he spoke. On a point though, you said that both. Uh, the member for Georgetown South and the member for uh, Central basically stood up at, at the same time. Yeah. But you, did, uh, you also pointed out that he, you didn't think that he was ready at that point in time. Why, why would he have stood up then if because he wasn't, he didn't if he wasn't ready? Because he wanted the debate to close. He wanted the opportunity okay. to speak okay. because the speaker was closing the debate. Okay, got you. Right? Got, got you. So mm -hmm. he, if he wanted to get the opportunity, he had to get he had up to and, take, and take and, it and, then. And I think, and I, I must tell you, I thought he did exceptionally well for the under time. the circumstances. Yes, under the circumstances. But you see, not knowing what was going on there, right? Mm -hmm. But but I thought I thought he I thought he I thought he dealt with his constituents' matters very well, and he also dealt with, with the budget. Although he didn't have all of his notes and everything that he had been preparing for days, but, but you know. Yep. Okay. When when we return from the hit, uh, eight o'clock news, we're going to talk more about the proceedings in the legislative assembly and. Uh, some people may want to offer opinions in terms of the debate that has taken place so far, as far as the first time members, you know, how did they do, uh, how well their speeches were written for them, or you know, whatever as well. So please stay tuned. We have lots to talk about. Don't change that dial. Listen to the 8 o'clock news, and then we will return. Good morning, and welcome back to For the Record in the studio with me. My two co-hosts, Dr. Steve McField, Ms. Theresa Pitcairn, and the leader of the opposition, and Honorable D. Ezard Miller. We're going to turn the microphone back over to Mr. Miller because it's his day. <laughs> but let, um, I want to deal a little bit with the, with the um, speaker's ruling that members of the opposition cannot be referred to in the Legislative Assembly as shadow ministers. Mm -hmm. um, which is, which is rather strange because the, the Bible of parliamentary um, procedures or skin maids on page 49, the official opposition is very, very clear, right? It says the importance of the opposition in the system of parliamentary government has long received practical recognition in the procedure of parliament. 
even before the first Reform Act, the phrase Her Majesty's Opposition had been coined by John Cam Hobhouse. In 1937, statutory recognition was accorded through the grant of a salary to the leader of the opposition, mm -hmm. which has always been, it's been that way here since 2000. Mm -hmm. The prevalence of the whole of the two-party system has usually abated any uncertainty as to which party has the right to be called the official opposition. It is the largest minority party which is prepared in the event of the resignation of the government to assume office. The leader of the opposition and some of his principal colleagues in both houses form a group popularly known as the Shadow Cabinet. <laughs> and and, to, and insertion of my, this is my words, you can't have a shadow cabinet if you don't have shadow ministers. Cabinet under the Westminster system mm -hmm. is formed by ministers. Mm -hmm. Continuing to quote from Erskine Mays. Each member of which is given a particular range of activities on which it is his task to direct criticism, <coughs> excuse me, of the government's policy and administration and to outline alternative policies. Since the strength of modern party discipline tends to reduce the effectiveness in the House of Commons of a direct attack upon a government, the criticism of the opposition is primarily directed towards the electorate with a view to the next election or with the aim of influencing government policy through the pressure of public opinion. The floor of the House of Commons provides the opposition with their main instrument for this purpose. Accordingly, the opposition has the right to exercise the initiative in selecting the subjects of debate on certain number of days in each session, and on such occasions as the debate on the address in reply to the Queen's speech, or from time to time by putting down motions of no confidence. The leader of the opposition is custom accorded certain rights in asking questions of ministers and members of the shadow cabinet and offer official opposition spokesmen are also given some prudence in asking questions in the debate. And, and the speaker seems to believe that because, as he says it, we are not a sovereign parliament, that we don't have the right to have a structured and organized opposition. Westminster system mm -hmm. demands yeah. it. It cannot yes, work yes. properly without it. That's right. Okay, now the point that you are not a party, because reference was made somewhere there to a party as well. Does the point that the opposition in, in our legislative assembly now is not an established party in any way, does that have any effect no, to it? No, because our constitution clearly provides okay. Okay. for none, for independent members to select a, group, a uh, member uh, yeah, of the to, opposition. Yeah, our group sat down and they selected me. They signed a letter which was given to the governor that they wanted me to be the leader of the opposition. We don't have to have a party, right? So he's, he's, in, he's, in, he's trying to stretch that interpretation. But, but listen, the country needs to understand what's going on here. Now let, let's, be, let's be realistic here now. This, this, this there was only one purpose of all of this on Monday. That is, was for the government, through the speaker, to try to reduce the popularity that the opposition was gaining. The whole purpose on, 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 on Monday, when I, because they knew I would, on Wednesday, sorry, when they knew I was going to speak, which is, again, is parliamentary tradition and whatever, the, the leader of the opposition is the person that responds to the throne speech, the budget address, etc. right? So they knew I was going to speak. The constant day-long harassment of me and my speech was to try to create an opportunity to name me, right? And, and try to reapply this, this, this title that I've never deserved as being this bad behaved member of parliament and this obnoxious individual. Trust me, when Mr. McLean gets up, they're gonna be the same game. Okay, we have one caller. Let's go to the phone lines. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For The Record. Good morning, O.C. Good uh, morning um, to Dr. Mark Field, and good morning to the Honorable Opposition Leader, Mr. Edward Miller. And Mr. Risa. And Mr. Risa, sorry. Uh, it's okay. Good morning to you. Good morning. I apologize. It's okay. Good morning. I didn't, he I didn't hear her voice. Um, first, uh, I want to say um, that the last little bit I heard there in respect to what the Opposition Leader said is so on point. 
since Wednesday and we started Parliament, there seems to be uh, a designed game that has been playing. Um, and, and I know that the great Dr. Maxfield has warned me so many times to say, Kenneth, politics is a game. You've got to be prepared to play the game. And I think last night, because I didn't see particular moves happening, caused me to throw me off my game. But it's a learning curve that I will accept um, that they got one over me. Uh, and I, I, I know I'm glad to see that um, there was some anticipation by members of the public as well as members of parliament to what I was going to say and how I was going to perform. That's good to have that expectation because it gives you a platform to perform on if you're prepared. But but that expectation also had a, um, a contrived plan to set me up because for the whole weekend, and Mr. Miller is there to um, support my argument in respect to this, is everybody was asking me, so Ken, when are you going to speak? When are you going to speak? When are you going to speak? Trying to get me out early because they know that I was taking a lot of notes and preparation to respond to all of those who went up because I was intentionally trying not to go before the government. Now, as Mr. Miller already highlighted, the, um, the Speaker of the House will ask three times if there's any other member who wishes to speak, and there's this game of waiting to the last minute to stand. But we heard comments in, in each break about the government just wanting to shut down the debate. So there was a threat to say, OK, then they're going to try to stop the debate and just allow the premier to respond so nobody got to speak. So prematurely, I tried to get up because I was fearful of losing my, my position. Mm -hmm. And I think that the speaker dealt with me uh, quite unfairly because he knew I was not prepared. But obviously trying to help the government, and I think this was an intended move, trying to help the government to either um, stop the members in the opposition from speaking or trying to squeeze us out early before their members spoke. I'd also like to highlight that um, though I was not prepared with a speech, I don't speak and I don't read from speeches that other people write for me. But that privilege was not given to me, but it was given to other members to be able to have somebody write their speech and to just stand there and read it. I read from my heart about the issues that was going on. And I dare, so, dare say that maybe I may have been all over the place, but I know my speech wasn't written by somebody else. Um, so I, I would say that if my performance, and I know OC, you are a person who um, gives me advice on how to make sure that I'm doing well in respect to politics here and there, or just give advice, not necessarily because you're for me or against me, mm -hmm. but just a good person giving another person advice, that um, you may say I mean, it was a little bit here and there, but yeah, it's I did. I did say that, and I and, and I. Uh, I don't know if you heard me this morning, but I did correct myself because when uh, uh, the leader of the opposition, Mr. Miller, explained to us what happened, then I said I, I did say to myself that uh, uh, I did say publicly the fact that I had said that you were all over the place and you were a little bit um, sketchy in terms of your um, your delivery and everything else that now I understood why that happened because you weren't really ready uh, at that point in time because you know uh, your your advisor quote unquote political yeah. consultant asked me last night you know how you did and I and I and I and that was my remark to him yeah. and yeah. I corrected that this morning you know once I was but, able to determine from Mr. Miller precisely what occurred but your assessment was 100 percent correct mm -hmm. and I even afterwards was a little bit disappointed to say I allowed them to play the game and get one over me. But I can promise you, and I can promise the public, that experience that I had is a very valuable one. I may have lost this debate in respect to not performing at my highest um, altitude, but it's a curve that I learned and I can promise you will never ever happen again. I realize truly now what Dr. Mark Field has talked about so many times, that games will be played and people will protect their own interests. And I honestly must say on record this morning, I am disappointed the speaker put me in that position, knowing well, in fact, that I was not prepared because I was taking my notes on everybody so I can have the right opportunity to respond to each and every position. And, 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 and also, Barbara did stand up before me. And she also spoke from a written speech, which is not allowed. I didn't, I, I, my intention was not to write from a written speech or read from a written speech because it's not allowed. But obviously, leniency is given for newcomers. I want to do it the right way, and that's what my intention was. But I just hope that has enough clarity 
um, and, and I give support to, to opposition leader in respect to what he said so far this morning because he's so on point about what is actually happening in the political game in the House in the debate right now. Yes. So those are my comments. Thank you so much for allowing me to say them and have a good day. Thank you very much, Mr. Brian, and all the best uh, in your future uh, debates uh, as well. We're going to take a, com a commercial break now. When we return, we will continue our discussion with the leader of the opposition, Honorable D. Ezard Miller. Please stay tuned. We have in the studio with us, along with my two co-hosts, uh, the lead of the opposition, the Honorable D. Ezard Miller. Mr. Miller, uh, there's an adage the gov in, in, in uh, parliaments, uh, the opposition shall have its say, and the government must have its day. And also, we have heard, and I have constantly spoken about the late Speaker of the Legislative Assembly, the Ed, late Edna Moyle, and uh, I was privileged to be in the Legislative Assembly the day that she accepted the uh, role of the Speaker and, and uh, took the chair as Speaker of the Legislative Assembly and the delivery that she gave in terms of the role of the Speaker. And she was so emphatic about the fact that the Speaker, one of the roles of the Speaker uh, an important role of the speaker to pr protect the interests of the minority in the legislative assembly. And, and it would be interesting to compare her inaugural address with the inaugural address of the current speaker, Jock and Gs. And nobody gave speakers in a course time than the current speaker gave to the Honorable Ada Moyle while she was speaker in terms of, of, of challenging her and, and, and rulings and everything else on the floor of the assembly. But the government is the government because it has the majority of people in the parliament. That's how they become the government. Yes, You can't be the government if you don't have the majority seats, whether it's in the form of a coalition, as we know have now, or it's an outright election by a group. So while the opposition must accept that we can criticize and we can complain and we can try and hold the government to account. The government will have its way because it has not only its day, it will have its way, way mm -hmm. because it has the votes, the majority of votes. However, if the opposition does its homework and makes its presentation properly, mm -hmm. we would expect that the government would heed our advice as time. I'll give you two good examples where we didn't have a struck, where we had an opposition, but they didn't do nothing, laid by the current Speaker of the House. When the government brought the National Conservation Law, me and Mr. McLean filed, I think it was 37 amendments to the law. We managed to get 30 plus of those amendments changed. Now, the only reason to accept an amendment coming from myself or Mr. McLean, who were in the um, southeast corner in a minority position and were not part of the official opposition to the House, is it made sense. It made the law better, the education law. We filed 25 amendments to that, and all of them except one, and I believe even that one in the end was accepted, because I don't see the particular clause in it that gave special protection to Kim and Brack and Little Game on, which we objected to, because they're part of the country. Mm. That Whatever applies to us must apply to them. But the role of the opposition is to try and make what the government is doing better by being constructive in our criticisms, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? It shouldn't be just a negative campaign and uh, uh, just complaining, and, 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 and we don't do that. And the reason I have gone to the trouble to assign and appoint shadow ministers, because you you don't have you can't rule me out of order here this morning, <laughs> is because no in the Westminster system there is such a thing as a shadow cabinet and shadow and shadow ministers, right. but is so that I can devolve the authority. And, and it's impossible for one person to do everything. I, I, I recognize Emily Chris Saunders' particular expertise in the financial industry. He's a certified public accountant. He has experience in the financial industry. We have, a, we have agreed, and this is done collectively, and this wasn't done home in my house, mm -hmm. and then I just give it to them. Yes. That he would be the spokesman for finance and financial services. Mr. McLean's expertise, he's a marine engineer, he's an engineering and the, the whole section to do with, with infrastructure and all works, that sorts of yes. stuff. Mm -hmm. So obviously, he's the person with experience in that. He 
has agreed to accept the responsibilities that deals with that ministry, and he has also accepted the responsibility to deal with with the tourism ministry because that has other infrastructure implications, i.e., the airport terminal, the port authority, the major projects under the under the Minister of Tourism now are related to Mr. McLean's expertise. Okay. Mr. Suku, right, is a well-educated fellow. His his bachelor's in, is in computers. He has a master's in in, in uh, uh, business administration. So we assigned to him the. And he agreed to accept the responsibilities to do with labor, immigration, community affairs, etc. Like, my expertise is in healthcare. So I accept the responsibilities for healthcare and I include education in it, right? Because at least I have gone through, all of us have gone through institutions of higher learning, right? And when something comes up, I have, we have said publicly to the press if you have a matter that you want a response to, from the opposition on financial services. Don't call me. Yeah, call be a spokesperson Chris. for that. I trust yes. him. We all trust him to say the right thing. We ha- I don't have these people, don't have to call me and say, I, I-, I go on the radio today, can I mention this? These are these, these are adults, these are, these, are, these are people. Now, the Premier can't do that with his people. Why? Mr. Bush couldn't do that with his people as leader of the opposition, right? Mm-hmm. Because you have, for you to develop the people around you, you have to give them the opportunity to, to venture out and exercise themselves. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm Arden not- coming here. Arden know how to call me and say, I'm right, going on there. Can I say this about the port? Uh-huh. Whatever he says about the port, I can back it. Yeah. If I can interrupt you for a second, I must say I was, I was pleasantly surprised when I listened to uh, Emily Austin Harris's um, contribution. Mm-hmm. And I recognized then that he wasn't ad libbing that he was reading and many others beside himself but at that time i rated his delivery as one of the best i was also surprised pleasantly surprised that he was able to um, express his personal views and opinions and certain things and mention those areas that he did not disagree you know with the government you know about talked about you know mortgages and things Mm -hmm. of that nature so i was glad for that one of the things that i am deeply disappointed about though and that people are crying about here in the cayman islands is the whole issue of residency and caymanian status and we have not heard anyone on the government side address that issue they have talked spoken about immigration reforms in uh, you know uh, workforce development and stuff like that. have not spoken no, about no, no, that touchy spoken, no, issue they, of uh, about com, uh, about uh, Caymanian status. We heard Mr. Suko, for instance, pointed and stated that Caymanian status should be so granted right. on two grounds, right? right? right. And but the government has spoken loud on immigration. We just haven't heard him. No, no it's in the speech. Yeah, it's the door is still wide open. Okay, <laughs> look at the revenue side. Um, work permits is going up by six million. Mm-hmm. There's only one way to increase that because they're not increasing fees, according to them, is yeah. to increase the numbers, mm-hmm. right? Okay. And we're still and they still have the position that they adopted in 2013 under the regressive progressive government, where we threw the door open and now everybody who had to do it before seven years can stay for ten years, and you have the you, and you have the absolute right to apply for PR in year nine. I, I want to give my two co-hosts an opportunity for any comments if they have any. Uh, uh, Ms. T, Dr. Steve. No, the, um, the, the, I would I would just like to go back to um, to the introduction by Mr. The, Mr. Miller uh, about the the comments made by the speaker in in the Legislative Assembly pertaining to the role of the courts and in the Constitution context. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm quite surprised um, because if you look at the Constitution. The, 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 the role of the, the Grand Court and the Court of Appeal are integral part of the whole part system. In fact, it is the Grand Court that the Constitution gives the right to, 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 to determine any matters of a constitutional issue, mm-hmm. including whether the Speaker is right or whether the Speaker is wrong. No. And so, and so for, for, for the Speaker to, to, to have this sort of onslaught on the Court 
in the Legislative Assembly. I don't know that if there's a precedence for this anywhere else in the parliament and in the, in the, in the, in the, in the common parliamentary system. I mean, to say that he's not giving the hand search to the court, I mean, I just can't believe how, how what power he, he has to do that because the courts can demand the hand search from 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 from, from parliament. The courts can demand all those things from parliament. And it's the courts that 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 that, that decides on 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 um on on on, on whether things whether a law pass is is intra virus or ultra virus the constitution. And so I don't understand how the how the speaker in in in, in the legislative assembly can trump try to trump the court. It's the opposite. Well, I, does I it, does that, Erskine May speak to that? Uh, in in uh, oh yeah, Erskine May is in, in, in relation May to ac court's access to does, to, to, does to not do. support his argument. Okay, right. And but uh, but but I am surprised and I, I am disappointed that the chief justice has not come out and made a statement on those proclamations made from the chair by the speaker as to how he's going to treat the courts, right? Because I mean, what makes it so ridiculous? in its entirety is that these things are now broadcast on TV live mm -hmm. on their YouTube. Mm -hmm. Anybody that wants to use it in court doesn't have to go to the to go to the to the and LA to get it. Yes. They can simply download it off of YouTube and mm -hmm. play the video mm -hmm. in, in, in the parliament. So what is the purpose of, of this like as you say, Mr. Mayfield, this usurping the authority of the courts to use the hands arts mm -hmm. as and I've always heard all of my years around politics and the courts is that the reason the, how the judges determine intent of a piece of legislation particularly if the law is drafted in an ambiguous way yes is by going to the hands of mm -hmm. the parliament and and extracting intent based on what people say they intended to do yes right and one one of the funda one of the principal fundamentals of of of, of um statute interpretation is the common the common words, mm -hmm. the the ordinary meaning of the words, and if you can't get the in, um, the the in, interpretation from that, then you go to the answers, mm -hmm. to or or the or the committees or the speeches to see mm -hmm. what the intention was and what the mischief that the that that the that the legislature was trying to to solve to, to or to to solve at all, and so I don't I just don't understand this. It seems to me that the speaker probably needs some sort of. Um, um, legal advisor to advise him before he, he make these kind of utterances, where, where especially where the court is concerned. But but in absence of that, the the, 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 the the chief justice, in my view, needs to step forward and protect the court. Yes, I think so. I think so. I think so. And and, and another thing, another thing is the is the PAC committee. Well, you know, the PAC committee is 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 a committee of the of of the whole house. Because it, the, the members are selected from the members of, of the legislative assembly, they select their committee. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, one of the one of the things that that the PAC committee, the Public Accounts Committee, has is to scrutinize and to d d d delve into all the government finances. Mm -hmm. And and even 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 the PAC committee has the power to even ask government government to 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 whether or not public appointments are needed mm -hmm. or whether the people are qualified for such appointments they can they can have what we call a pre-appointment hearing if if for instance if the government is trying to hire someone in, uh, in a in a particular job or in a particular department the public account committee can 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 can, can do that mm -hmm. so to to for the speaker to tell the public public account committee what it can what it can say and what it can ask the government to do or where where it can make inquiries it seems to me that it's just it's really out of order okay we have to take a commercial break now please stay tuned for the record we'll be back shortly good morning and welcome back to for the record we have one caller let's go to the phone lines caller good morning welcome to for the record good morning everyone good morning sir um when i was listening to the, what was being said about um interpretation of the law mm -hmm. Um, I find it uh, interesting that we don't include in the final legislation the memorandum of objects and reason, because that would be helpful in understanding what the policy <laughs> was why, when the law was created. And um, I think that, that, that 
that should be included and there's other things that needs to be tweaked but that's a glaring thing to me what what is your guess well, it used to be, but I, I noticed that they don't have it in now. It used to be in, 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 in the, at the beginning of the law. It would say the objects and reasons for the law was always there. And then that, that was, but, but that was just only one thing. The courts goes to, to also to, 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 to the paragraphs and different paragraphs and things they got to see and, and what, what the law says. But, but, but the objects and reasons are, are, for somehow, are for some what now taken out. Of the laws, I see. I don't see any of the laws now that have been passed now have the obvious reasons of why the law was passed or why it was. No, right. no, they're still there. They're still there. I, I don't I, see some of them don't no? have it. Really? Yes. Okay. Some of them don't have it, and 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 the and the reasons why it has been amended. So mm. Mm. we get it. We get it as part of the green bill. Yes. Okay. But it doesn't all uh, always appear pa- in the actual the official law document. Yeah. The, yes. the law okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I. I I would like to hear the explanation from the uh, AG's office or the government about why it's not included, because to me, that excluding it doesn't aid the public in better understanding of mandatory information or legislation, I should say. Uh, Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much, caller. We have another caller. No more calls. Mr. Miller. But, but um, Mr. Uh, Dr. McField raised the, his concerns of the Speaker's um, declaration on ruling um, on what the Public Accounts Committee can do. And he has ruled that cannot, um, we cannot inquire into the operatives of the public service like employment. Right? And his final statement is, this is my ruling on the matter I have spoken to. Um, now, one of the things that we have been trying as a, as a PAC is to modernize the, 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 the PAC and in full cooperation with the Auditor General's office. It is, it is fine for the government, for the PAC, to be looking at accounts and use of money after the fact, and most of this is a year later, and trying to assist the Auditor General in getting the changes that need to be made in procedures and, and policies within the government to correct those inadequacies. But it is just as important for the, the PAC to, to step into the modern realm of the, of, of the PACs, and that is that we're also looking at current, what's happening currently. And, and we have done a little bit of that by the most recent report by the Auditor General's Office on its um, review of capital projects. Right, ongoing. We also need to move on to the next step where we can get involved with, with government's uh, plans and, 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 and development of, of particularly like capital projects in the beginning to make sure that they are following all these new rules because there's no, there's no point of having the, the, the new rules in procurement, etc., unless we have a way to make sure that they're being followed. Because after the fact is not always the most appropriate thing, right? Um, and it's going to be um, very interesting. The only real power I believe he has over the, the PAC um, is that the summons that is sent to call witnesses is usually um, issued under the by the clerk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm of an order from the Speaker. Now, he, I guess he could say that I'm not going to allow you to summon this witness. Uh, if he does that, then I think that the PSC would have to challenge that at the time it happens, right? Um, the, the problem we have is that when we get these kind of, of departure from the norms, the place to arbitrate it and the place to get the final is because the speaker has a boss. The speaker's boss is the full legislative assembly, mm-hmm. right? Is to appeal to the full legislative assembly. Um, I don't know that the PAC can rely on the majority of the members in parliament to for the support and the backing that it would need to challenge the speaker's ruling on something like this um, because 
uh, as I said earlier, um, I'm not a great um, conspiracy theor- um, theorist, but this statement is not done in isolation. Well, I'd just like to read for you what it says in the House of Commons mm-hmm. um, rules on select committees. It says, that there's a whole lot of stuff, but I just want to read the relevant one. It says, some select committees, such as, have a role that crosses departmental boundaries, such as the Public Accounts Committee. Mm-hmm. Um, committees, depending on the issues under consideration, they can look at any or all of the government departments. Other committees are involved in a range of go- ongoing things. And then it says ongoing things, investigations like administration of the House itself or allegations about the conduct of individuals. And then it goes on to say pre-appointed hearings pre-appointment hearings that's on the Select Public Accounts mm-hmm. Committee enables the committee to take evidence from candidates to, for certain key public appointments before they are appointed. <clears throat> hearings are in public and involve the Select Committee taking evidence from the candidates and publishing a report setting out the committee's views on the candidate's suitability for the post. Mm -hmm. Hearings are not binding, but ministers will consider any relevant considerations made by the committee before deciding whether to proceed with the appointments. And then it goes on to say, hearings have been introduced on a pilot basis. The purpose of the pilot is to monitor and assess the impact of pre-appointment hearings on the number balances and quality of appointments so the, mm-hmm. co- the select committee has a wide power mm-hmm. and, and 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 especially where it where it relates to anything that government has to expend money on whether it be a port or airport or an airplane or a, or, a, or 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 hiring someone to work in a government position because it's expending the, the money the government money which the public account committee has has the has the con, has the right to to answer to bring people in as witnesses and to bring people from anywhere to to appear before it and subpoena people see i think um for a long time we hadn't really appreciated the role and importance of the pac because it's really a body that is there um to ensure that we get value, value for, for money, money. yeah, mm-hmm. and and that um, the spending is economic, it's effective, and it's efficient, and that requires a lot of transparency. So we're actually entering into a relatively new age. Uh, what I, and I've been doing a lot of listening this morning, obviously, and reflecting as well. What we're now seeing is the emergence of an organized and structured opposition. I'm tempted to say something to Mr. Miller, but he might get a little offended oh, no, because, no, 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 no. because it's no longer the Mr. Miller that we used to know. Or and this is not to mm-hmm. necessarily criticize you mm-hmm. in a in a in a in a bad way, mm-hmm. but no, no. it's 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 it, yeah. It seems as though this is pretty organized, structured. The arra- the the topics are arranged and organized and. They're there, and I was, you know, during the break, I was listening to Mr. Miller say that um, the speeches that they have is also available for the public to review. So it will now perhaps provide us with that kind of balance Mm -hmm. that, you know, we probably need more than ever. When you hear some of the things that were uh, discussed in the in the the debate speech, and invite our government also to step up as well. Mm -hmm. And and we're seeing now a public accounts committee that is prepared to meet, meet frequently, as frequently as possible, and not be a rubber stamp for things that are, you know, uh, that they have to deal with. Because in the past, that that was basically what it was all about. That, you, they're, know, you didn't hear a whole lot. They're, they're the rigorous. I mean, I'm hearing yeah. stuff today about, you know, you know, like I said, I've been doing a lot of the listening about even who people em- who the government employs mm-hmm. because again we have to get value for money uh, when people are employed is that in, in compliance with the law et cetera, et cetera. so this is this is hardy this is good this is heartening okay we we're going to headline news now so folks please stay tuned for the record we'll be back shortly in the studio with me miss theresa pitkern dr steve Markfield, honorable leader of the opposition the Honorable D. Ezard Miller. Before I go back to Mr. Miller, you've heard him refer to um, Erskine May, which is the Bible of uh, all parliamentarians, the Bible of Parliament. And I just want to uh, give you uh, a little information on uh, Erskine May. 
Uh, some people pronounce it, pronounce it Erskine Mays, but I believe it is Erskine May, M-A-Y. Um, and his most famous work was a treatise upon the law, privileges, proceedings, and usage of Parliament, known pro popularly as Osk Erskine May, Parliamentary Practice, or simply Erskine May. It was first published in 1844. Uh, the book is currently in its 24th edition, 2011, and is informally considered part of the Constitution of the United Kingdom, informally considered part of the Constitution of the United Kingdom. The guide is authoritative in many Commonwealth nations, often with strong influence on constitutional convention. Well, in, in, in Our authority to reference Erskine May is, May is actually specified in our standing orders. Mm -hmm. Our standing orders specifically mm -hmm. says on matters that our standing orders is not clear on or not reference on, it must be referenced. The speaker must reference and members of parliament must reference Erskine May. And 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 it, it's similar to, it's similar to Erskine May is the is the Bible of, of, of the of the British Parliament mm -hmm. system of procedure. Yeah. And just is similar to in our in the law, in the criminal system Big Archibald, the book Archibald is the is the Bible of the criminal procedure, mm -hmm. and and in the civil and in the civil um, matters in our courts, we have we have the Grand Court rules, and it also says if something is not in the Grand Court rules, or then we have to go to the White Book, which is the English procedure rules to see whether or not it covers it covers it covers the situation. So Arskin May is the is 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 the is the authority on. And, and parliamentary procedure, yeah. and it is quoted all over the Commonwealth in every Commonwealth Parliament. Mm -hmm. um, when when the local Parliament standing orders do not have anything that covers the this, this situation. Okay, now, Mr. Miller. Um, but just I just would like to oh, just say one more thing sure, before, sure. before I leave the the park committee. One thing I would like to see um, come back um, imposed in the in 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 in, in the park committee procedure is the Auditor General's report. Now, the Auditor General is a creature of the Constitution. He does not belong to anybody. He does not belong to the governor or to anybody. He belongs to the Constitution. That's what the Constitution says. And in every other jurisdiction in the Commonwealth, the Auditor General report goes to the PAC committee first, before, and the PAC committee lays, once they read the Auditor General report and approves it, then they lays it on the table, and that's the first time it becomes public. It should never be public in the newspaper before it goes before the park committee. That rule has to be has to be imposed, and the, and I understand it was so before, and then the standing, they 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 brought in standing order to change it. Mm -hmm. That has to go back to the rule, the former rules of parliament, that the auditor general report does not become public until it goes through the park committee. Mr. Miller, and, and and we're slowly getting it back, right? But here's the bigger problem we have, is that because we don't know when the legislative assembly is going to meet. Right? I mean, we have proposed in writing, we have announced it, we have invited the government to let's meet every Thursday, every other Thursday, twice a month, with a rolling agenda. In that case then, when, we got, when I get the thing, I would be able to table it within two weeks, right? The problem we have now is it could be six months, right? Before we, we, we would have done our um, report and everything else, right? But nothing goes to the public. But it does require that we, we and you notice now, that the Auditor General and the Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee issue press releases on the document at the same time. It's presented to us mm -hmm. before it's, it, it goes public or goes on the website. Okay, one of our listeners has written in and said, when Sir John Summerfield was Chief Justice, if he saw something unusual occurring in the House, he on many occasions would have the elected members brought before him, as well as refereeing referring, sorry, as well as referring to the Hansard in many cases, on many occasions, when he saw a new law coming before the House and felt it could cause harm, he got involved pointing out to elective, elected members where there could be improvements. Now it's different folks for different strokes. I don't, I don't, I, 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 well, I mean, I was there when Sir John Mofield was, was, was um, uh -huh. Chief Justice. I don't recall 
in a parliamentary and getting summoned by him. Yeah, to I'm wondering whether or not the, 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 the word was, summons I, I, is being used loosely and whether well, or not I, I he know that, that I know that, an audience I know that. with them. As, as we do now, the, the, the government um, often, I, I think, still references new legislation to, to the, the Chief Justice for for practical um, for, for for a judgment on the practicality of it. Mm -hmm. None of good was writing a law that the Chief Justice can't administer. Yes. Right? And and why would we why would we want to always have it to be confrontational? Because the the, the under our constitution, as Dr. McPhee referred to order, the court has the ability to say that legislation does not comply with our constitution and refer it back to the legislative assembly for it to be corrected. It would, I, I, again, I would think that we'd be much more sense to be proactive, and if we and if we bring in really new and, and cutting edge legislation, for instance, the uh, the law on the um, conditional release, mm -hmm. um, I believe that there was there was discussion all around. Yes, which and and, and that's, that's that's good. Yeah, that's the same way that the parliament should work with the opposition. It, it should be a discussion of the matter before the assembly, mm -hmm. right? It, it shouldn't be the, um, a discussion of the member from our side. Okay. We have one caller. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Uh, good morning to you. Good morning. Good, good morning, morning, sir. To the three musketeers, and, and good morning to the honorable you, 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 you haven't heard from you in morning, a few yeah. days. Yeah. I hope you've not been sick. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes my nonsense might not be appreciated on the radio. Oh, no, no, no never. No, no, don't yeah. say that. That's, yeah, that's yeah. not true. But I see it. I have to sit for hours and pick shoes just to say for a couple of sentences. First, I'd like to say um, this, my friend Mr. Raymond Scott just called me and told me because I didn't hear the 7 o'clock news that there are two men missing off East End. The poor house already called him from last night and begged him to immediately try and help. And he did contact three ships last night and gave them, you know, what he thought was best instructions like looking to the north of, and going towards the west of the Grand Cayman North West. And uh, he's running up the rock around to try to get coal or any other ship. He wasn't able to contact him this morning, but uh, you know, he takes that very seriously. Mm -hmm. so, I'd like to say to um, my condolences to the family of my wonderful friend. Prince and Blake, or Blake, yes, I've known him for the past seven years. We've been to friends and um, condolences to all the family. Uh, he, he, what, what we were just saying a while ago, um, before the elections, I said that my hope, or my prayer would be that all 19 members would get together and decide immediately to move our constitution forward to what Bermuda had. Though we know maybe they got it for the wrong reason at the time they did that, but now it seems to work for them as far as immigration, as it worked for the issue, as far as bringing in thousands and thousands and thousands of cars is concerned, and so forth. It's working for them. And they're steadfast in their things. So I, I thought that might be, that might have been the best move to do, to go towards that and also move towards some form of direct income tax that never stops saying that see more as events on board that's necessary. I wondered when you said that you might have to take the court and step in and, and say that this law isn't isn't um, going according to the Constitution and maybe you should change it. Um, isn't the Attorney General there to advise as you get up and debate and, and then pass a law to say, well, that this law should, shouldn't be um, put forward as this, as this, let's redo it or something. Isn't that what he's supposed to do? Yeah, but he would do that at, he would Cabinet do that stage. at the generation of the legislation, which would be, because there's a, there's, there's a three phase at yeah. least in, in, in developing yeah. legislation, i.e. you got to come to Cabinet with a, with a purpose to do legislation and get permission to issue drafting instructions. The drafting instructions mm -hmm. should be approved by the cabinet. And then when it comes back in its final bill, it is approved by cabinet before it's gazetted 21 days before it comes to parliament. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and one of the 
uh, things that they look for. They want to ensure that legislation the is... The bill doesn't comply with the general one day. Okay. Yes, uh, I, they, I, they, I... They make... Sorry, uh, Carla, I was just going to say that they want to ensure also that any legislation that it certainly passes the constitutional test, test as well. Yeah, it's not yes. ultra virus of the con constitution. It's not constitu yeah. constitution. Yes. And, and he sure. should do that, but 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 there are times when, when, when we could get it wrong. And if somebody then asks the court for an interpretation of, or, or, of whether this law does in fact comply with the constitution, our constitution allows the court to say yes or no, and if it says no, it doesn't, then it, it, it has to come back on parliament, mm -hmm. has to address the court's concerns. Mm -hmm. Great, Colin. I just got a little bit confused. I still am to tell you the real truth. Why why we have such a convoluted system running around in circles. It seems because to me that Attorney General is here, the chief um, legal mind, so to speak, as an advisor. And then you have legal advisors beside that too. I, I, I just thought that, you know, he would see it, step in and say, well, this law is, is not correct or but then I guess um, most of us, I believe, um, just like our uh, thousands of half idiots around here, really do not understand. That's why I appreciate the show so much. Um, the complexity of the, the British parliamentary system, and we get so often confused with the simplicity of the U.S. Yes. system, where it's, it's a republic and the, the lawmakers are... The, have the most power and they can no but the same thing they have their courts but can yeah. rule is that it is the courts in the united states that will rule whether a law is unconstitutional or not exactly yes mm -hmm. but it would take a long the only thing that the u.s supreme court can hear is a constitutional matter nothing else whatsoever so it, it, it would have to blatantly be breaking the constitution in some way or other i, I can't think well miss well caller I, I i appreciate you what what you your 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 calls and stuff and i heard you on another radio sh show sometime some evenings ago and you were trying to explain to the radio host there the difference between a, a republic uh uh um uh independent country and and a, and a colony and I don't think that they got it right. When you were trying to explain that, you were very frustrated. This is one of the this is one of the reasons why um, um, I think that you have to keep on helping the public to understand the system in which we live. Yeah, we are our our for instance, our attorney general is different from an attorney general in Jamaica or Barbados mm -hmm. or Trinidad or United Kingdom or Canada or Australia. Our attorney general is is a public officer appointed by the governor as a civil servant. In those other countries, the attorney general is elected by the people. He wears two hats. He is member of parliament, and he's a member of the cabinet elected by the people. Mm -hmm. Our attorney general is not elected, and he's not, and he's a member of cabinet, but he has no say in the and cabinet. Allowed, and allowed to sit in our legislative to sit in assembly, assembly, which is assembly. another, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's another anomaly <laughs> that we need to go into. That we need to go into. Yes. So, so and, that, does, so, and does not protect the public interest. Correct, because it says in the constitution that he is an advisor to the government. It doesn't say that he is to protect the public interest. And that is one of the reasons why when we talk about, for instance, who is protecting the public okay. right? To go walk on the beaches and the and the and, and the access to the beaches and nothing has been done about it mm -hmm. because it's not his duty to do that. And in England, in other places, the Attorney General will step in and bring an order to move those those, those barriers to the beaches. Mm -hmm. And that is what Bermuda has to call. Yes. Call. We're going to ask you to leave us there, though. Uh, we have to take a commercial break now. For the record, we'll be back shortly. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. We're on the last leg of the show this morning in the studio with us. We have. Uh, Leader of the Opposition, Honorable, Honorable D. Ezard Miller, my two co-hosts, Ms. Theresa Pitkin, Dr. Steve McField. Um, the, in, in, in addition to the role of the Speaker, when there are committees of the uh, Legislative Assembly, Mr. Mr. Miller, mm -hmm. when there are committees of the Legislative Assembly, there are times when the Speaker will also chair their, those committees. In this particular case now, when uh, the budget bill goes to the uh, committee stage uh, for any, uh, any amendments or whatever, uh, that's usually on what, the second reading, a third reading? No, the committee that's stage. Committee stage, you have first, yeah. the only time that first the, second reading, right. third reading, committee stage, and the third reading. The only yeah. time wow. that we had the speaker 
put as chairman of the finance committee was the famous motion 390. Hmm. Okay, yes. Right? Remember yes. when, because we had a, we had a dichotomy, we were outnumbered in finance committee, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the financial secretary at that time was more in bed with the opposition and government than with the government that he was part of. Because mm -hmm. he resigned after. <laughs> well, <laughs> as well. But the story yes. about that is left to be told. <laughs> but in this, to case, <laughs> in this case, the, on a normal bill, the speaker would come down and take it through the clauses of the bill and deal with amendments. But because this is the finance bill, the standing orders say that the Minister of Finance will chair this committee. Okay, okay. And, and it's often time, you can have a committee, the committee that I recommended, the select committee that I recommended to deal with the healthcare crisis that we're in, was I recommended that the minister be the chairman of that committee and it be a, made up of six members, four from the government and two, because committees, in Parliament should be structured according to the number, the ratio mm -hmm. of the people in the government, because the, the government must always have the majority mm -hmm. on these committees, right? Yeah. Um, but it's 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 going to be chaired by the mm -hmm. uh, Minister of Finance. Ms. Ms. T says that okay. some of the bloggers want to hear about the doc. Well, my disappointment was, and you know, the Speaker ruled me out of order and told me I couldn't use the figure three hundred million because I didn't have written evidence that it was going to cost 300 million. And I think the, 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 the uh, Deputy Premier and Minister for Tourism raised, raised that. Uh, no, yeah, he got he up, him, both, it, yes. both him and the, and the Premier got up on a point of order yes. and the, um, the Speaker went in favor of them. Which point of order doesn't exist in standing orders, by the way. Um, and I would allow him to show it to me. They, but their, their argument is that I was saying I was misinforming the House because the dock was going to cost 300 plus million. And the, I asked the member responsible for the port to tell me what it was going to cost, right? And he took the thing he said he would do it in his speech. Right? In the speech, he never mentioned the number. The truth is because they don't know what it's going to cost. And, and this is the real risk of thing here. It could cost 500 million. Because this is the process that they're doing. They have selected a company through a pre-qualification process that they've invited to design, construct, finance, and maintain a dock. Now, that company, I don't know, I hope, I trust, I pray, I will be advocating for, and I will be demanding in finance committee that some ceiling has to be put on this thing. And that the, whatever the pier is going to be designed, it has to be designed within certain parameters, right? Because if you if you just leave them carte blanche, because you've not got a different company that is financing it, there's no checks and balances, right? So they can design anything, right? They could design a, a dock out there that all the railings have to be trying to one carat gold plated, right? We don't know what the con, and he couldn't. He, well, you know, you know, he couldn't prove me wrong for the three hundred. But if we look at the history of this dock. We had a contract signed for it for, I think if we go all the way back, that there's six administrations that have dealt with this dock, right? And most of them have been around 300 million. We go all the way back to when um, um, Chucky was, was minister responsible, the, the number talked about was 300 million. Mm -hmm. Then we had the the government um, come in next and, and they went with a, um, with a signed contract with a company which was aborted to book of the China company. The number talked. Right, right. They, they, they were about 250 million, mm -hmm. somewhere around there, mm -hmm. right? And then we were bringing in um, uh, China, China Harbor. Harbor because they were going to do the, the cargo dock. Now, remember now, the 250 million was only the, the cruise pairs, the two cruise pairs. It wasn't, wasn't no big expansion for the cargo to convert Georgetown Harbor into a transshipment port. And the people in Georgetown, if you want to know what transshipment port look like, next time you're flying into the Norman Mall International Airport, Sit on the left hand side of the plane and cast your eye out as you as you're flying over Kingston Harbor mm -hmm. and you will see what a transshipment port looks like. It's not pretty. But the 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 government can't say that the port is going to cost two hundred million dollars unless they have put that in the contract. Right? That they can't that whatever they design cannot exceed the amount, right? So I was disappointed that they, that they couldn't do it. But the people need to understand, right? What's happening here? And I asked the question from the floor of the assembly. What is being covered up? We have asked the Minister of Tourism and the government 
to give the opposition members a presentation on the port and the airport, um, new terminal and other improvements to the airport, three times verbally. We put it in writing in June, right? And nothing has been forthcoming. They couldn't come down there yesterday when the minister got up and says, what is the leader opposition talking about? We don't have anything. Here are the plans. Here is what we want in Georgetown. We want seven acres of cargo. We're going to have to dredge out the 15 foot depth dock for the cargo if we bring in cargo ships that are going to bring um, five, 6,000 containers into Georgetown Harbor. They're big ships. They There's, can't tie them up onto the cruise ship dock out, out under the deep water, you know. Mm -hmm. But they can't put gantry train on the cruise ship dock. There's a similar scenario that occurred in Bermuda. And I, you know, I'm just putting this marker out there. The um, WF Wade International Airport, mm -hmm. the previous government entered into an agreement with a Canadian company, which eventually, just a few weeks ago, that company was acquired by a Chinese company. Mm -hmm. The opposition asked for the details of that agreement, and the government refused mm -hmm. to provide it to them. You, you, you know the opposition has it now, and how did oh. the opposition get it now? Because they're now the government. Mm -hmm. That was that agreement oh, no, no, was no, no, no. part of what caused but the, what you know, the government what you might, in Bermuda what you to might fall. know mm -hmm. is that we went a whisker close to having the same thing done here really? by the same company. I happened to got invited to a presentation of the Chamber of Commerce because I had signed up as a member of the Commerce to be interested in the infrastructure development projects. And it was unveiled to us that they were contemplating bringing in, might have been the same Canadian company, to take over our airport and, and, and upgrade mm -hmm. it and everything else. And I went public with it. Mm -hmm. And they had to back off. Canadian, those Canadian companies are trouble. trouble. Well, we the, the, the Canadian company of the airport came. I was chairman of the airport uh, air, um, of of the of the um, of the building committee at the airport mm -hmm. then, and we rejected them. And but, they, but 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 you you, you can confirm yeah. that that was the, that was part of what the government wanted to do. That's right. That's right. In fact, they came mm -hmm. to us to our meeting in the city had the government support. Exactly. And we asked them for the letter from the government to, to, for their support, and they couldn't produce it. And we adjourned the meeting for them to produce it. They never came back. Mm -hmm. okay. And then they and then they tried to get a, a, a local one of the company. Things, one of the things the, they were doing was they, they make a huge presentation of mm -hmm. how we short a land, right? Mm -hmm. But they were going to do three billions, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I said, well, why would you do that if, if you short a land? Mm -hmm. I mean, the concept was was real. But okay, <laughs> we're, we're almost to the end. So, Mr. Miller, I want to give you an opportunity <laughs> for some closing comments and you know, look in your crystal ball and tell us what do you anticipate to well, take the, place the, in the Legislative I, Assembly today. Of course, I will be listening intentively right. uh -huh. as long as the stations that are carrying it make sure that <laughs> it goes But I, I anticipate time. that my, my, my good friend and colleague, a member from East End, Mr. Arden McLean, is going to have to endure, endure the same kind of unnecessary interruptions and etc. We need to get something to make his debate. You think he's gonna get be named? Tell me tell me what this naming is. Uh, not oh. only me but then uh, right. the, for the benefit of the listening mm -hmm. audience, what, what does it mean? Hey, Could what? they call you a nickname or what? No 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 no, 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 no. <laughs> Here, here's what happened. Right? For instance, um, if I had persisted mm -hmm. in using the term shadow minister when the speaker said I couldn't use it, yes. right? Or if if you say something disparaging about another member yes and the speaker says withdraw it, and you mm -hmm. refuse to withdraw it, mm -hmm. right? Then he can call you by name. Yes. By right? your he specific do, name. He don't Ezra say, he don't say a member for Northside yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. He say Ezra Miller. And then you know you're in trouble because and, I, and you, you, when but, your parents but, usually call you by but what the that name that they don't normally call you by, you're in trouble. <laughs> what that means is you're going to be suspended from, the, from, the, yes, from that yes, sitting, yes. and yes. it can be up to three days. Mm -hmm. And I think anything beyond that, he has to come back to get the Legislative Assembly authority to extend it and all that sort. But in in parliamentary vernacular you just said you're named Same, by yes, the speaker yes right you remember you may remember the time that um uh peter peter lloyd named um the honorable jim Borden. yes and he refused to leave yes mm -hmm. and they called they had to suspend the parliament and bring down the police and, and, and all that mace with him. And he, he, pick with up, him. he picked the mace up and, and and made it to the first step because that mace not light you know <laughs> and he dropped it on its on his head on his crown and bent the little crown out of 
almost a 45 degree angle yeah, yeah. right mm -hmm. and it was like that it was part of history and they straightened it out somebody you know, understand, um, yes and they wisdom corrected straightened it. it yeah you know but 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 i know the, the, the government's gonna get this budget approved yes, we're not we going to that. vote yes. we're not going to vote against the government budget we're just we're here to we are going to try to fight to get some some additional money for education and, and because we really believe and this is a serious matter that we went to all the schools we needed to do it we, and we're going to invite the government to do for the schools what they're doing for the port. If the government doesn't have the money and we can come up with a design, build, finance, maintain proposal and invite proposals for a port, why can't we invite the same thing for, let's say, to complete the John Gray High School, but with four to four to five million, mm -hmm. right? Um, the new primary school in West Bay, 20, 25 million. A new primary school in Barton Town, Savannah. These things are desperately needed, right? We're gonna have serious problems come the next school year, right? And say, listen, we want a proposal to invest a hundred million in education. All three of these projects could be ongoing; they could be started quickly, and we could have these three schools for September next year, or at the very latest, January the following year. The same process: design, build, maintain. Or, if we can't get anybody who will do it, because they, they got to get their money back somehow. Mm -hmm. Remember now, we're giving the port, the whoever, it is my understanding, yeah, yeah. and it hasn't been contradicted, that the whoever does this design, build, finance deal for the port is going to get control of all revenue related to cruise ships visiting here for 50 years. Mm -hmm. We could be we're, we're projecting 142 million for work permits over the next two years. Let's take 10 million a year. Mm -hmm. Right? And say, listen, if you invest in 100 million, right, we will take 10 or 12 million, depends on the financing deal, because you gotta get a man, gotta make some money on it, out of the work permit collections, right? Because all of the people who pay in work permits take care of money and it, so let's, let's, let's make them pay for it, mm -hmm. to educate our Caymanians. And say, okay, we're gonna pay you 10, 12 million a year, you get your money back, you'll make, if you invest 100 million, you start have a, over a 10 year period, you, you'll make, 20 million profit, that's a pretty good investment. Mm -hmm. And let's get it done. But here's what we won't do. We will do that to produce what I regard as basically corporate welfare. Because this port, although they tell you about all the taxi drivers and all the other people mm -hmm. and all that, ask them what they're making of the port. This port is done basically for two conglomerates in this country who control the cruise industry and get all the money made from it. And that kind of corporate welfare, I am diabetically opposed to. Okay, folks, I want to thank you for allowing Radio Cayman and by extension for the record into your homes, into your vehicles as you traverse the busy roads of the Cayman Islands, into your places of work, whether it be an office cubicle or if you're working in the outdoors. I want to thank my two co-hosts, Dr. Steve McField, Mr. Risa Pitcairn, and finally I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition, the Honorable D. Ezzard Miller, for being on the show this morning as well. I also want to remind you that we are our brothers and our sisters keepers. There is always someone out there who's less fortunate than we are, and I ask you to extend a helping hand to them. If you can't do that, then I suggest you donate to a worthy charity because we always want to consider those who need not necessarily those who want or those who crave i say to you have a great day continue to support your radio station radio Cayman. you can listen to the proceedings of the legislative assembly live on radio Cayman. that is on breeze 105.3 fm and we trust that they will start on time when the breaks are taken that they will continue to have those proceedings come to us immediately after those breaks. We know that there may be some communications issues between the LA and the studio, but those are minor matters that I believe can be um, that, that they can be remedied, and that we can get a, a smooth and consistent and continuous flow of the debate in the legislative assembly. I say to you, have a great day. Listen to Sterling Dwayne Ebanks at 12 noon on Talk Today. And as usual, we ask the good Lord to bless these three beautiful, wonderful Cayman Islands.